The following program was made possible thanks to the generous support of our Kickstarter backers. Well, first, Hobbs was born, and he just said, all in fire. Sup, Holmes? Beware! Your host, Jonathan Ho! Thank you so much, everyone, for joining us uh, on this show, this snowy winter show here in Massachusetts, where I live. Michael Todd, where do you live? Uh, I'm currently in California, in the Bay Area. Um, I live in right now in Halifax, Nova Scotia, so I'm oh. not very far from you. I'm wow. slightly north. Yeah, yeah, but, yeah. So uh, it's been snowy for you, friends. too, I'd imagine. Yeah, yeah it's, it's lovely here in California. We're getting some nice light rain. So. <laughs> yeah, you lucky dog. Uh, and you on Twitter are known as the at game the game designer is your your Twitter handle. When I first saw that, I first immediately assumed that they, you are a part of some elite group of uh, things, people who do things like a Voltron yeah. team. <laughs> Illuminati <laughs> confirmed. Um. <laughs> well, where there was only one game designer, and that was you. Like, there'd be a, a computer uh, engineer and an architect and a film director, and then you being the game designer. Is that how you got that name? Uh, so, basically, I, I don't know. I'm, I'm sort of, my names are, everybody calls me Michael Todd for a start, not Michael. I introduce myself as Mike 90% of the time, and somehow, every time, the group just sort of gravitates to calling me Michael Todd full, like, one word. It, it, it was a meme for a short while when I was when ESJ came out and I was popular on the internet, it was hilarious. <laughs> Is that, 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 uh, real quick, uh, when uh, ESJ, Electronic Superjoy, came out, I'm a big-time meddler. I don't know if you knew this about me, but if I like a game, I will like talk without the designer of the game even knowing a lot of the time. I'll talk to people I know who are publishers or developers and be like, look how awesome this game is. Maybe you should work with this guy on a thing. So when I played Electronic Superjoy, I immediately sent it to Gaijin Games, uh, formerly Gaijin Games, now known as Choice Provisions, who yeah. made Bit Trip Runner, and I was like, whoa, this would be a cool team-up. And they just wrote back to me, Michael Todd? Todd Michael? Send. And I was like, how about we actually talk about it? And they never got back to me. I don't know if you yeah. actually... Do you know yeah. those guys? Yeah, I know those guys. Um, I really like Bit Trip Runner, actually. It's one yeah, it's a fun game. Part of five, definitely. Yeah, yeah, um, and of course your game being very different, but uh, similar sensibilities in some ways. Yeah, it's interesting, because I came at it from building different games. I built puzzle games. This was my first real platformer. Hmm. Um, and my friend, uh, Droken, um, so, like, when I was living in Toronto building ESJ, uh, I was hanging out most days with uh, Droken, who made uh, Star Sea Pilgrim, right. and um, uh, Randy, who made uh, Archive. So they're... Droken's just sort of a genius platform designer. Uh, he knew everything he needed to teach me. And then I was living down in Phoenix with Steve Swink, who wrote Game Feel, and he's, like, literally, he wrote the book on making platformers. So sure, uh, the platformer just sort of happened. <laughs> huh. So uh, out, it's still, I'm still interested in where the game designer name came from, because you so hang was, out with game designers. Yeah, no, that, that was back when I was uh, growing up. Like, when I was a teenager, I'd been building games uh, for, I don't know, as long as I can remember. And then, like, the group growing up, my identity became the game designer. I uh, hmm. was the one who coded games all day as my spare time. I was um, homeschooled. So, I mean, I say homeschooled. I was unschooled in that my parents taught me basic math and how to read and then just sort of gave up. Uh, <laughs> <you become laughs> but unschooling, where you just teach yourself. And, and um, well, I was going to say, so how did you learn all of this stuff? So the group of friends I was in, um, we all just were all uh, homeschoolers or unschoolers, and we taught ourselves various things. Um, we turned out all right. One of us is a physicist, and another's a computer science um, guy in Switzerland. And I, I don't know. I'm probably the dumbest of the group, really. I make video games. Uh, yeah. So my my handle was like the game designer. So I've got it on Hotmail and Gmail and Skype and all the things because I've just been. Uh, it's funny. I uh, I thought I w I didn't know what indies were until I went to my first GDC. I didn't know we existed. I was making games, and I thought the other people making games were you know Blizzard. Like right. I knew very little. And then I go to GDC, I go to the first Indie Summit, and my mind is just blown by the fact that other people like me exist. Huh. It was wonderful. And when was that? Uh, well, that was the first Indie Summit, so um, 2008, maybe, I think. Huh. But, um, and I met, I met uh, Sean McGrath, who later went on to make Dyad, and John Mack, who just made um, Everyday Shooter. Sure. And I recognized them from the Toronto airport. 
So I saw them in San Francisco. I was like, oh, you guys are game designers, and you're from Toronto. And then they introduced me in San Francisco. I met a bunch of people in Toronto. So then when I went back to Toronto, I actually was then part of the the just beginning to grow uh, video game design community. Huh. That's awesome. And and before 2008, how long have you been making games for? So I've been making games on my own, and uh, with various friends, I shanghaied into it uh, since I was 14. Wow. Uh, they they thought it was interesting and that they played video games and so forth, but then they sort of then they went to university and got a real job, and I was just the one who was stupid enough to keep doing it. <laughs> Not at all, and I'm so glad that you did. What what were some of your earlier games like? So the the first game I sold was called Engine of War, and you can still buy it somewhere. And I don't know that it runs anything newer than say Windows XP, mm. uh, but it was a it was a shmup sort of uh, Crimson Land uh, everyday shooter ish. And you shot zombies and uh, cyborgs and so forth. And then you killed them, took money, and went into your upgrade screen. And the upgrade screen was an electronic circuit simulation. So you build a mech, which you then used to shoot zombies to get money to build more upgrades. Huh. Yeah. That sounds great. Weird. Back yeah, in the that's... dawn of indie games, before genres were really a thing, before we were all, we were all just yeah. making weird crap. But still, yeah, sticking zombies in there, sticking mechs in there, these are all things that, growing up, uh, I know I liked... Similar how you knew you liked designing games, but you didn't know anyone else did. Uh, yeah. I thought I was the only person who liked zombies. I thought I was the only person who could like giant robots. And now it's like... Now uh, it's everybody. everybody. It's, yeah, it's, yeah. yeah, I remember the first time I saw a zombie comedy, I was like, wow, this is a thing now. This is so mainstream that they can make, like, a rom-com, but about zombies. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Are you talking about Shaun of the Dead or something before that? Uh, I think it was Shaun of the Dead. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, there's been a couple since then. Yeah, I, I also met a bunch of other teenagers who wanted to be video game designers and were, like, researching by playing tons of video games all day. And I was like, no, no, you've got to learn how to code. You've got to, you know, you've got to work. And they didn't want to. They were just essentially, you know, they just wanted to play games and they were justifying it to their mom. But right. <laughs> I was like, that's cool, but I actually really want to make games. Right, so, and they I, they would too, I'm sure, if they could just snap their fingers and a game would be made. But the process of making games right. interested you pretty early on, it sounds like. Yeah, I've always been very systems-oriented. So I got into it as a programmer, and that's sort of how my brain worked for a long time. And now I do art, and I do business and marketing, and um, like I, I'm bad at all of it, but I have five or six different skill sets, essentially. Uh, and And that's really useful from an indie standpoint, because it means I can come up with a crazy game and I can work with a team, and the team can be remote, and the team can be dropping in and out because someone had to get a job. You know, because mm -hmm. indies is so undependable, uh, not not through any fault of their own, just because of the, the nature of the lifestyle. Sure. And then I like it when I'm on a team and I'm trying to push my vision and make this game, and an artist drops, and that's okay. It just means I have more artwork to pick up on. Mm -hmm. um, I can sort of uh, fill in anybody's uh, gaps. But then on the other hand, because I'm bad at everything, I get to work with, uh, like, I've worked with Dom2D, who's a very talented 2D artist, so I can't even imagine uh, being as good as. But I can also, you know, pull it up in Photoshop and tint the colors and move it and crop it and, you know, do right, stuff. Right, right, right. Uh, well, busy. there's a lot of little things that I, I, I can relate with you deeply. I've worked on uh, animated shows for YouTube and had to, you know, do the sound effects. And there's a lot of things that go into that sort of stuff mm -hmm. that you can think about. And you have to... There's a lot of little details that the real artist wouldn't want to bother doing, like a scrolling background. He's like, Jesus, this is boring. I like doing like explosions and action scenes, but because I know a little bit of animation, I could do the scrolling background. So he wasn't as miserable, and therefore uh, he didn't quit as soon. Yeah. I mean, eventually, I, of course. I found that with the level designers in Electronic Superjoy. So the fun part of building the level was actually putting out the blocks and the hazards and setting it up so you're like, okay, you jump over these things and you duck under this thing. And then... The, the shitty part of building a level was making the background and all the style stuff, because it was different for, like, every level, and it was a huge amount of work, and you had to pick a musical track, and you had to really tie into it. And it so it was, like, two days to build a level, and uh, maybe four hours of that was building the actual level, mm. and then the rest was all the polishing and tweaking and balancing and making the colors work and making sure that the gameplay didn't interfere with the colors and vice versa and the music. And so we refer to that as eating your broccoli, because all the level designers, they quickly rack up, like, five levels that had no art style to them. Uh -huh. And then I'd have to go around and eat everybody's broccoli, and I'd be like, no, come on, guys, we got to actually all do our thing. <laughs> sure, sure, sure. And that game, that series, it has become a series. It's been going on yeah. for some time now. The first one, 
Electronic uh, Super Joy 1 came out in 2012? Yeah, I think so. Uh, yeah. It was early access before that. Um, so it started in, it came out in like June of that year, and then it officially came out like August, September. And yeah, I've, I've uh, made a, a variety of other games. I was actually, we were tossing around, Cassie and I were tossing around um, ESJ2, like a really big one with 100 new mm-hmm. levels and coming to consoles and stuff. Um, it's a possibility. I don't think we're going to do it next. Both of us are sort of working out where we want to go for our next projects. And, sure. Uh, Cassie Chu? Chu? Cassie Chu. Yeah, yeah she was on Cassie the show Chu. Too. She was on the show two years ago, I think. I, I still yeah. didn't know how to pronounce her name properly. Before, I think, Electronic Super Joy came out, you guys were still working on it then. Yeah, um, I remember that interview because I, I was uh, that was when I was crunching like an insane amount. I was just like swamped, not not sleeping. Yeah. And uh, I was just sending Cassie off to do all the interviews because I, I couldn't, I was cross-eyed. <laughs> <laughs> sure. And you pulled it off. Uh, congratulations. But uh, to backtrack a little bit more, so the first game you sold was called something of war. What was it called? Eng- Engine of War. Yeah, Engine it was a of War. Ago. Zombies, androids, mechs, and it's hard to, to play at this point. Did that yeah. sell really well and that made you think, awesome, I've got a career, or did that uh, was um, a little bit... It, it made me hopeful. Uh, mm-hmm. It so over about the next two years, it made about $80,000, uh, about half of which was selling the rights to sell in Europe and Russia to a Russian publisher. Hmm. They, they then cheated me out of, like, parts of that. Oh. It, was, it was a giant, stressful year. I had to translate the whole game to Russian. But I'm not complaining, because the job I quit, because Engine of War was making just enough that if I lived really cheaply, I could live for a couple of years. Uh-huh. The job I quit was uh, mopping floors at a crack shelter, which, let me tell you, was the worst job on earth. <laughs> Do they have an actual shelter that uh, distributes crack now? <laughs> <laughs> or just a, a shelter that involves a lot of crack uh, users? Yeah, um, we got paid danger pay because of the chance somebody would uh, stab us or bleed on us or something like that. Danger pay? That sounds like a, a cool video game. Maybe you should make that next. You know, maybe you get stabbed. 80 bucks goes into your thing every second. Oh, 80 bucks. It was $16 an hour, which was amazing. <laughs> kind of amazing. Well, <laughs> at the time, the problem with being a game designer, the problem with being a self-taught game designer, is uh, if, you, if you succeed, you get to be a game designer. And if you fail, you get to serve coffee, because there's no in-between. There's no skill set. Like, if you're, an, if you're a software engineer who moves into being a game designer, then your fallback is to get a job as a software engineer, and right. then maybe a shittier, like, programming job where you're doing not the language you like. Whereas the problem is when you, you have self-taught game design skills, you either make it as a game designer, or those skills are useless on a resume. Yeah. Yeah, I'm trying to think of what you could consult. Maybe uh, you can maybe do web design. Yeah, it, it's I've I've since done consulting jobs. I've done prototyping jobs, um, and now I'm pretty solidly for the last couple of years. ESJ, the one thing it's really done for me is it's allowed me that I work for myself and I make I make my games. Whereas before awesome. that was part time and I had to constantly scrabble for money. Sure, sure, sure. So after uh, Engines of War, what did you move on to after that? Um. So I made a game called uh, Puzzle Wizard, and I made, and then, so I made a couple of smaller, uh, kind of, I was trying to go casual, it, it, I didn't really know what I was doing back then, and then I got into the indie scene, and I got, I met, uh, I was at GDC, I saw Petri's Game in a Week talk, I heard all about game jams, and I got really into it, and I started making games in a week, in ten days, and so forth, and I made um, Silent Skies that won a contest, uh, Gamma, uh, something or others at GDC, and then... I made a, an RTS called Broken Brothers. And these were all very small. These were all sort of really cool prototypes that didn't actually deliver on the, the vision. You know, there'd be three levels instead of 40 levels. Sure. Um, and so I, I did that for a while, and I was mostly living off savings and living off jobs. And then um, I got I did some contract work and stuff. And then essentially I, I, I got older, and I decided I really wanted to build larger projects, projects I spent a year on, projects I spent two years on. Mm-hmm. And... Um, the the prototyping the jamming stood me in really good stead. Like I had all the skill sets that I'd slowly built up from going to jams. Um, the jam community in um, Toronto when it was starting out, I remember when it was just five of us in a room and like uh, GPC was one of the earlier ones and Waffle Jam and uh, uh, the Toronto Game Jam has been around for a while. But now it's huge. Now there's hundreds and thousands of people who play who make games in Toronto every year. Yeah, 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 it's really blown up. Uh, and you were right there on the cusp as it was blowing up. I was very lucky to be in the right place at the right time. 
Sure, sure, sure. Uh, so when you decided to do a big or a bigger project, was that Electronic Superjoy? Yeah, that was definitely my biggest. Um, I had $100,000 in savings I'd saved up from uh, contract work, working my ass off, and I put all of that in and ended up, when the game went on sale, I was $87,000 in debt. So it was a $187,000 budget. Wow. Which is a lot for one person to rummage up. And uh, I worked my ass off because if the game didn't make it, I was going to declare bankruptcy because $87,000 of debt is quite a lot. <laughs> that is a lot. Uh, do you remember the moment when you went from money in the yes. bank to negative? Uh, it was what was that? Yeah, tell me about that it moment was, when you. It was Christmas Day, I think 2012. Um, and I we were in a Christmas sale, and I came out. Um, we'd been we'd been doing all right. Like the November sale had done something, and we made eighty thousand dollars that day. And I was just like, "Oh, thank God! Oh, thank God! I'm not in debt anymore." <laughs> <laughs> but how about the moment when, to me, it sounds like a turning point moment. Uh, when there's a, I think it's a, a decision you're making, a level of commitment happens when you say, "Yes, I'm going to go into debt." Like I've had a hundred thousand oh, yeah. dollars now. I do you remember the moment when you're like, well, yeah. from here on out, it, it's actually a loss. I'm losing on this, and, and I'm assuming this is before the game was done. Yeah, oh yeah, long before the game was done. Um, it, I, I there was a while where I had to pay people with you know giving them more percentages and just sort of promises and hope. And um, there was a point I was in Toronto. I'd done a bunch of traveling and lived in Phoenix and Winnipeg and, like, jammed out my games. You could actually, if you look at the, not the in-game name, but in the, like, the file name of the levels in ESJ, you can see where I got depressed and where I was, like, where it was snowing, because I was like, fuck, it's snowing again, dot level file. Um, <laughs> Those aren't the actual level names. That's no. the file names. Got it. Yeah. <laughs> um, and then, so there was a point I was walking across Toronto because I didn't have three bucks for a bus, bus ticket. And I was I walked for four hours and I was like, oh my god, this was the worst use of my time. If I only had three dollars, and uh, I decided I had to go into debt then because that was that was the I was spending my money and money and money and it was down. And then I had like no money in my pockets and I was barely going to make rent at the end of the month. And then I was like, well, I can't do this. I I'm going to waste too much time worrying about clipping my coupons and and getting you know walking instead of taking the bus when I need to just actually finish the game. Right. So I sort of scrounged. I borrowed a couple thousand, uh, four thousand from my brother. I found a, an indie dev who uh, anonymously helped me out with another 10k. Went to the bank for another 20k. Put 6k on my credit card. Like you know, slowly built up the debt. In I, the problem was I couldn't go into debt fast enough. I banks don't trust you if you're an indie game developer. They don't think you're gonna pay it back. <laughs> right, right, right. I I knew a guy. Uh, he's yeah. gone on to compose music for games. He's a very talented guy. He mm -hmm. took out a five thousand dollar loan from the bank just because he didn't want to work. I don't know if that was the <laughs> wise choice, uh, but it, it worked out for him. He, he well, he found himself kind of. You know, he ate a lot of pizza. He watched a lot of TV. He tried not to move because uh, the the more you move, the, then the more you have to eat later. It's all about time, <laughs> money, and like burning calories. So he would just try to be like sedentary, so then he'd have to spend less money on calories and and make the most of his time. Uh, interesting, though, that it sounds like it came down to you seeing that uh, your life course is a person you have to choose. Like, well, am I yeah. going to waste time but gain money? Uh, but that's time I'll never be able to get back. And then, you know, before I know it, I'll be 50 and the game won't be done because I kept taking on little jobs. Or am I going to lose money but then gain time to then work on the game? That sounds like the, the, the calculation. Yeah, the, the calculation of being time rich and money poor or money poor and time rich is right. something that ESJ spanned the... So there was times when I was money rich but time poor because I was running the company. I didn't have tons of money, but essentially I had to hire employees because I just had no time. I'm one person. I can't physically stretch myself to go to Boston and show at the show, but also fix the bugs in time for this deadline, right. uh, which is where um, Cassie came incredibly useful. She, I hired her originally as a, an intern level designer kind of thing, and then she became the other part of the team uh, very rapidly and uh, built a whole bunch of the levels, but then she really started to shine in dealing with the community and flying out to conferences. She's a, she's a total con rat. She, you know, she she would die happy if she could just be at PAX for 365 days of the year. Whereas I'm an old man. By day two, I'm just like, oh, God, I want to go to bed. My knees hurt. Oh, God. Um, so and then so that that's where Cassie and I really found our equilibrium, where she she would, uh, you know, essentially help me have more time by going to all these events and dealing with all these things, and I could uh, program. 
Right. And it sounds like uh, you didn't have a ton of money when you met her, and I don't want to... Uh, well, I did. I had the 100000 in savings, right? Oh, okay. And then, and then that ran out. So there was a period in the middle where I had no money. <laughs> <laughs> no time either. Uh, and, yeah. You had no anything. So, but it seems like she was so passionate... Just going by my, my talk with her on sub homes, I think I've seen her one other time in life. I just, like, waved high and gave her a hug and then ran away. Uh, but she was so passionate about it. Like, money didn't seem to be a huge concern to her. She just loved the project. Yeah. I'm really glad that um, I've been able to pay Cassie a whole bunch of money in retrospect. You know, her percentage. No, because she doesn't care very much about money, and it's all about passion. She's she's the best type of gamer there is. She's, you know, in it for the for the pure joy of playing games and hanging out with friends and in, in a very happy, positive sense. Mm. And so she's, she's fine, just, you know, she works at a, um, a A&C, which is a, a video game, like, physical shop where they sell games and comics and stuff, and uh, she's just happy as long as she can get enough to pay rent. Yeah, yeah, so yeah. It's also, Envy, the, the guy who did the music for ESJ, um, he, there's a whole story there, but he was working as a butcher. Like... <laughs> <laughs> really? Jay made him enough money that he could quit and go full-time musician, which is wonderful. Uh, because they I feel like talent like his is wasted butchering, you know, pigs. I mean... <laughs> yeah, I mean, there's a talent of butchering, uh, butchering right. pigs, too. But uh, who is he doing more good for total? He's and his an music amazing, is... like, DJ music. musician. Like, it's, it's going to waste. Yeah. Um, so one of the things I was able to do was send both Cassie and him like decent checks, and I've been able to make rent myself, which is and pay off my debt. So I'm quite happy. ESJ, it do, didn't need to make me, you know, Minecraft levels of money. It it really it transitioned my life from sort of a hopeful game designer, and uh, Cassie was sort of trying to get a grip in the industry, trying to get a real job. Um, you know, she had a degree and she had some internships, but you know, it's it's hard in this industry. Sure. And then, uh, yeah, I. And then Envy, I just sort of descended out of the blue like a thunderbolt. That's like, oh, I love your music. I've been listening to it for years. Can I use all of it in the game? And he's like, um, sure. Because <laughs> he was a butcher at the time. He and didn't he, have that yeah. sort of. Yeah, yeah. And he uh, didn't know anything that was going on. And I just sort of showed up a year later. And he was at PAX. He was at the PAX we showed. But he didn't stop by the booth because he didn't know it existed. Like, he didn't know it was a real thing. Were you giving and away the it wasn't real thing? That? Was this PAX East? Yeah, or? yeah, yeah he, that's where I got my first... It was on sale, and he didn't uh -huh. know it because of just bad communication. And he, he sort of thought I was, like, a lot more small time than I was, uh -huh. which is fair. Mm. And then I started sending him checks at some point, and he was like, whoa, okay, so, you're, oh, wow, you're on, you're on Steam. Okay, that's cool. And I'm like, yeah, I mean... Um, it's surprising to me as well. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And his music ended up in uh, Kickbeat, I think it's called. Yeah, um, he's had a couple of other games uh, where they love the music in Electronic Superjoy. He's also big on Twitch, just in that a lot of people on Twitch, you know, they play the Electronic Superjoy soundtrack because they played ESJ at one point, they liked it, but they loved the soundtrack. Right, right, right. And did you have anything to do with that deal with Kickbeat, or was that all through Envy and the Kickbeat? Um, I, I was involved in the email chain, but um, oh, I, no. I wouldn't take credit for it or anything. Yeah. yeah. Um, he he randomly, it, you know, the Impossible Game, like one of those early big successes on Xbox. Mm -hmm. um, one of the tracks in there is his as well. He has really? good music, but huh. um, the problem is he put up a lot of it for free, and so while it was in some cool places on the internet, he didn't actually get very much money for it. Sure, sure, sure. And. I uh, sort of alone out of the group of my friends, I, I used to not be about money, and now I'm about money because I want to make games all day. Not right. not for some horrible, dirty reason, just because I'd love to be able to pay my rent and make games all day. And so uh, at some point I have to focus on... I've become very rent-focused over the last two years. Sure, well, it's that time-rich versus money-rich thing. When you have money, then your time is finally your own. Uh, you don't yeah. have to spend your time for, for other things. Uh, so Electronic Super Joy, we've talked a lot about it. I am a remiss... I did not actually introduce what it is for people who don't know. What a what an interesting oh, yeah. game it is. Very striking. You know, the team at PAX East was so passionate. I didn't meet you or Cassie, I don't think, of that show. But I met these, like, uh, passionate uh, motley crew of volunteers. It was kind of like Voltron, yeah. actually. They all had their own powers. Uh, and they were so excited about the game. What is the game? What is Electronic Superjoy for people who don't know? So Electronic Superjoy is a super hardcore platformer based around uh, a musician, Envy's uh, electronic music. So what I did is I was a huge fan of his music, and I got a bunch of his music, and then I built each level, and I built, I designed the whole game while listening to his music, so that 
every tiny part of the game is informed by the energy and speed and pacing of his music. And then every level was tied with a particular track. And there, we did some things where the tracks, you know, would work in sync with the level, but most of the levels were just, uh, like, they weren't directly connected. They were just sort of built with the same vibe. Right. Um, right. And it's super hardcore. If you like, uh, like, V or Super Meat Boy, that kind of thing, then uh, the, the game would definitely be for you. If you hate raging and screaming and uh, yelling and throwing your computer under a bus... Um, <laughs> yeah, and it's called Electronic Superjoy. Uh, yeah. to, to me, I've talked about this a billion times on the show, so I apologize for the regular listeners, but when you have music or atmosphere in general that is really joyous, but you have gameplay that would, you know, theoretically frustrate, that tension causes when something... You past the the exhilaration of when you yeah. nail a level, it uh-huh. fits the music perfectly. Yeah, That's, yeah, yeah. That's one of the few things I really like about the game. Like, I mean, other people love the game. I built it so I can see every single one of its horrible flaws. <laughs> <laughs> I don't see any flaw. I think it's a great game. Uh, but it, it, it's themed around. Uh, stop me if I'm wrong on this. Your game, of course. But my, I took it to be themed around. When you go to a rave or a dance club, it's dark and you can't really see people. And all the characters in the game, or most of them, at least in the first game, they're, they're black silhouettes with white eyes. And it's kind of scary. And you're like, I don't know if I'm comfortable here. And it's tense. And it smells maybe. And then all of a sudden, you get the vibe. And you're like, this is awesome. And all that tension and fear and weirdness you might have felt when you first stepped into it uh, gets flipped like a coin, and the other side of that coin is like, uh, instead yeah. of extreme anxiety, it's extreme excitement and euphoria, and that's what tends to happen in your game, Electron Superjoy, uh, yeah. when you're well, when you're good enough, actually. I mean, I'd imagine there's some people who aren't good at it, and for them, it's just electronic super sad. Yeah, I, I have a couple of uh, friends who just call it electronic super rage. Um, <laughs> All right, so I was on the right track with that. Huh? The original storyline we were playing around with was that you're at a club one night and you go and try and find the bathroom and you get lost and stumble into another dimension and then the dimension is the game. Huh. But, uh, because it was it was built around like, hey, this is sort of a club, but it's a platformer. And um, that's true in like the sequel. In this, uh, the, like there's art which I've done for ESJ2 and it's like you're outside Club Electronic Superjoy and you're in the back alleyway and the Pope's out there and he's smoking. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, people who don't know, there is a, a... What's the name of the Pope again? Um, so the Pope in Electronic Superjoy is the Pope who was just active at the time and you kill him and then his his uh, his predecessor... Or no, his... Uh, successor? The one successor yeah. uh, comes along is uh, Pope Boris the Super Sexy. That's the one I remember. Yes. Um, and so story. where he was a villain in the first game, he's uh, he helps you in the second game to defeat the evil Dr. Swinger, I think. <laughs> it's a giant uh, robot stripper with laser nipples. In no, the she's city, a right? friend. She's just really pissed and destroying the city because someone stole her laser nipples. Oh, that makes sense. So that's the story. Initially, your story was... Um, kind of a never-ending story sort of feeling, it sounds like, where yeah. you, you get lost in the book, but instead it's lost in another dimension. Instead, you went with uh, a, a wizard stole your butt. Is that right? Um, I wrote that storyline at 4 in the morning. I'd been working for like 17 hours straight, and I left it on my desktop, and I told Cassie about it the next morning when, when I dragged myself into the office, and she laughed, and she couldn't breathe, and she laughed, and she laughed, and she laughed. I'm like, all right, well, it was just a mock-up to like, make sure I had some text on the story screen so, so I could see the font works. But that became our story. Uh, you know, you, huh. you lost your butt and an evil wizard has stolen your butt and you have to go to the back. And, uh, and uh, Cassie keeps coming into the conversation. Do you think the game would have happened without her? It sounds oh, like not God, only the amount of work she did, but the, the fact that she was... like I talked to a lot of game developers, as you know, and there's some who... I was just talking to Bertel Horberg, actually, who made Gunman Clive. Uh, mm-hmm. It's a fun game. The uh, sequel just came out on Electron on uh, the 3DS, and he works completely alone. And yeah. for him, that works because he doesn't want to like let other people down necessarily. But he also said to me, "But it, it would be nice to have somebody to like tell me I'm doing a good job, like while I'm working on things, or to have an idea that's like mine but even better, so I can have stuff to bounce off on." So he says, mm-hmm. pros and cons. If it was just you making Electronic Superjoy, you think it would have happened at all, or and if so, would it happened in a different way? It would have happened in a very different way. I think something would have come out the other side, but Cassie informed that game 
hugely. And so I actually work solo. I work solo right now, and I, I tend to work solo. Um, my company's called Michael Todd Games, and when there were seven people in the company, I felt very egotistical to have, you know, have named it. But it was named that because at the time, before I made ESJ, I, I didn't tend to have a team. I tend to work solo, so it made sense. Um, hmm. And, yeah, like, I was going to have the game be a little bit more creepy. My art style is naturally sort of spooky, scary. So, like, the, the ghost buffalo creatures, anything in ESJ where the art is creepy or scary or... Like it, that's probably me. Yeah. Yeah. Whereas um, her art style, I got her to come in, like, first day, October 2011, something, and she started making uh, little sprites, and she couldn't not make them adorable. Like, <laughs> it was a real problem. So I was like, okay, okay, I can make this work. I can make this work. We'll make the characters a little bit more adorable. And the whole game just sort of... She she was there from, uh, I don't know, the third or fourth week. Like, I built a prototype, and I decided I wanted to hire someone, uh, just a sort of two-person. I just needed someone to really... Uh, yeah. So and she so she was there for the whole thing. Huh. And uh, really strongly informed on the feel of the game. Also, a lot of the humor. Like, it's, it's always funny when you're with when you have two people who don't necessarily have a sense of humor uh, separately, but do together, like this particular sort of overlap of this is what's hilarious between these two people. Uh-huh, uh-huh. The yeah. chemistry that happens, and the way your brain chemistry and your mind's process changes when it's not just you in your own head, when it's you interfacing with somebody else. So you would say the Electron Superjoy humor only happens when you and Cassie are teaming up? I say it certainly reached, like... New Heights. Uh, I basically, my, I would write something and then I'd bounce it off of her and if she laughed her ass off then it stayed in the game and if she didn't, right. then it didn't. <laughs> yeah. And, and going I'm, forward, I'm sorry, go ahead. Well, now I'm working solo and um, I do miss working with Cassie. I do miss working with friends. Um, Cassie and I are still friends. Like, it's it's a bonding experience, but um, yeah, on the flip side, the control is nice from an artistic mm. standpoint. Sure. Um, being able to take as long as I want. One of the big pressures of working on ESJ was other people were going to lose their job if I fucked up. Right. Like, that was a thing. Yes, I'd have debt, but also I, I'd have to fire all of these different people. Uh huh. And at one point I had to fire someone who was my best friend at the time just because I brought him onto the company and the company ran out of money and I... I I had to pull him into my office and fire him, and then I had to go over to his house the next day and apologize for firing him. Yeah, but and that's a hell of a business experience. Like, uh huh. Thanks so was, it, <laughs> how did that uh, go? Did he understand that it was because he just ran out of money, or? Yeah, in in the end, it, we had a, like a week or two where it was uh, harsh. I stayed at his house uh, last week or something, so we're all cool now. But um, yeah, yeah. Huh. Wow, yeah. that's heavy. It's scary. I could see why you would never want to go through that again and stay solo, at least for a little while. Yeah. Um, yeah. So my next game, uh, it's it's less humor based, so it's probably it's more programming. Um, I do want to work on it on my own. I want to keep the the workload that isn't making new content for the community low. So mm -hmm. I'm trying to build tools up front so that I can build, I can do more updates and work with fans more. Huh. Um, one of the best things about ESJ, one of the best things, was the community. The Twitch streaming, the hanging out with people. I would get drunk on Twitch while they were playing my game, and then they'd start playing some other game, and I'd be like, I'm not going anywhere. This is, this is awesome. I'm, I'm having fun. <laughs> well, screw my game. Let's just, so, like, the community was the best part. Mm. And because of the nature of the game, it's, it's a, so to use a dev lingo, it's, it's, a, it's consumable content, and it's a linear game. So... Oh. I can make a level, and no matter how fast I make a level, people will beat it faster. You know, if I spend two days making a level and it takes somebody, you know, 20 minutes, that's sure. not a really great ratio. Mm. And essentially, the problem was they would play the game, and then the next day they play some other game, and so on. And that's that's life. But the community that really loved ESJ, there was one guy who bought 50 copies. There was a bunch of people who bought like 20 copies because they just gave it to all their friends. They loved it. And I couldn't give them enough of it because huh. I, I can't. I can't say, "Hey, wait here. I'll be back tomorrow with another year's worth of work." Like it just it doesn't work like that. Is that where Groove City and then Hot Sticky Mess came from to to feed the the audience that still wanted more? Definitely. Um, so Hot Sticky Mess was actually Cassie and Don, who were two people uh, on ESJ, uh, 
And Don was probably one of those volunteers you met at PAX. That's where he started. He was a volunteer who just loved the company and the game so much that eventually I hired him. Um, and Cassie, and they, they just wanted to make their thing. And Groove City was something I made on my own. Um, and both of us were just sort of playing around in the IP, making more. Yeah. Um, I really want my next game, though. My next game will be multiplayer, sort of like a MOBA. It will uh-huh. also have co-op. It will also have user-generated content. And uh-huh. the concept is, I want, when it, when there is a community, I want to go there and hang out. And I want other people to be able to, like, you know, like, I play uh, Mountain Blade, or I played StarCraft, like, every night. And it wasn't a new game. I just, I wanted to play with my friends. And so I'd love to be able to make a game like that. That would be yeah. dream come true. Such an interesting coincidence. That pizza guy I was telling you about earlier who took out the loan, he's mm-hmm. the one who did the music for Mountain Blade. Oh, wow. Yeah. He's Fuck, a great guy. I love that game. I was in it since the Alpha. I was one of the first, like, hundred players. I remember when they didn't texture the back of the shields. I have spent so many freaking thousands of hours. I'd have made at least two other games if I hadn't played Mountain Blade. <laughs> oh, it's, uh, the people who like that series love it, and I'm happy to hear that you're one of them. Oh, so it sounds like moving forward, you don't want to make a game necessarily that can be eaten and spit out and then right. not eaten again. You want to make a place people go to as opposed to a thing that they consume. It's also um, it's also a lifestyle choice. So what I've been doing for the past 10 years is the sort of the classic thing where you make a game and then you sell it and it makes a spike of money and you support it for a bit and it makes less and less money until it's not making very much money, and you make a new game. Mm. And the idea is you make enough money in that spike to live for two years so that you can build another game and market it and come out with another one. And it's uh, it's very failure-prone in that uh, all it takes is one real, really big tanking game, and you can't mm. do it anymore, and you have to get a job. Sure. Um, it's also very stressful, and it's also very unhealthy in that you have to work for huge long periods of time without any motivation except your own hope. And then you uh-huh. have to work a huge amount crunch time and then it and then you have to work after launch but in a completely different sense. You have to talk to people and you have to go outside out of your cave and go to conferences all of a sudden and now you have to be really social and charismatic. And then you have to switch as soon as you're at the high of being like, you know, surrounded by loving friends and family and, and you know, fans and going to community, you have to go back into your cave and code your game for another year. Like, it's the least healthy lifestyle I could think of. <laughs> going between uh, being an extrovert and an introvert and going uh, between someone who has to exp- uh, expel a bunch of ideas and then edit the hell out of them and then be, like, yeah. nervous whether you're an idiot for, ooh, I can uh, relate. Uh, not yeah. to a full degree, but I, I definitely get a feeling you know. So you're, you're trying to give that lifestyle up, and, and this new game you're working on might offer a different lifestyle? Right. So the game's called Scurvy Devils, and uh, the concept is that you're one of a bunch of pirates who live on this island, and uh, the game is a pirate ship MOBA. So I think, I think there's a gap. I think there's a niche uh, for indie MOBAs. I think the MOBAs that are out there now uh, are all super polished AAA kind of things. They all sort of look the same if you squint. They come into maybe two or three different art styles. A mm. lot of them are free to play, which is fine, but they're also some of them are free to play in some styles and, and some in other styles. Uh-huh. Um, and I think indies are too afraid of multiplayer and they're too afraid of not having people on their servers and they're too afraid of I'm just gonna make a single player game and that'll pay my rent for this year. And what I want to do ideally if everything goes well, and it might not, I'm only an alpha, you know, big disclaimer, I might dump the idea tomorrow, but um, I want to spend five years on this game. I want to come out with it in six months and have it in public beta and then in a year launch as a full game and then be there and support it for years. And this is because with ESJ, I'd go to this community of people who love the game and they're on Twitch, and they're playing it, and they're talking about how you get past this part, and, you know, someone's screaming on screen because they're the ones who are currently failing horribly to beat such and such a level. And my money does not come from them. My money Mm. comes from going and finding people who don't own the game, because these people obviously have already paid the $10 for the game, Mm. going and finding people who've never heard of the game and selling it to them. And so I did support the community, and I did hang out, and I did make new levels, and do, but I I did it for free. I did it for, for love. Whereas what I really wanted was to be doing it for love, but also getting paid for it, so I could do it as my full-time job. Sure. Instead of making one piece of free content, I should be able to make ten pieces of free content. Instead of one level, you know, in a month because someone had an idea in a Twitch stream, I'm like, oh, that's cool, I'll make that. I should be doing ten levels or fifty levels. Like, so it didn't line up properly. And so this uh, multiplayer game, part of it, 
I'm, I'm going to go free to play. I'm going to go very simple free to play. None of this five different currencies, and you know, on Tuesdays is this, and then you know, you're tricked into spending money. Um, and the the reason for free to play is it's because my fans pay me to make them the game. Uh -huh. And if I'm good at making the game, I'll have more fans, which will pay me more, which will allow me to spend more full time making the game. And I don't need to go out and knock on doors in order to pay rent and approach people who, who've never heard of the game and then sell them this thing and then leave and never talk to them again. Right. It's not community building. Free to play is for all the for all the fact that various indies hate on it, it's community building. It's it's self supporting. It is it builds a group of people who if they love it, like, oh my god, if Mountain Blade is free to play, I would be bankrupt. <laughs> I would have bought oh so much. Uh, so instead of having to please everybody a little so your game keeps selling, uh, yeah. you can make something specific for a certain audience, and as yeah. long as they, you know, put in two dollars uh, a week or whatever, or five dollars a month, that. even less yeah. than that. Um, and also, I do want it to be very viable to just play for free. Like I played Hearthstone for free for the longest time. I've recently blown about sixty bucks in there, but. Uh, um, and, yeah, I, I, I don't need very much to live full-time. And one of the reasons I'm trying to build this game solo is so that I don't need to support a studio of 10 people with mm. tech salaries. And I can live on a lot less than a tech salary and be totally happy. Um, I'm very happy to be my own boss and to be an indie developer. So if one year I have to live on half of what I would get as a job, that's, that's fine. And so one of the reasons for not scaling up and getting a big team and trying to keep it small is so that I can just, so, so that people can pay, you know, very little for six months, and that's fine, because as long as I have a couple thousand people playing the game, it pays my rent. Huh. So the less, uh, the smaller your team, the less money you need, so the less uh, people need to pay. Yeah. But then, of course, you get to spend less money on uh, uh, Mountain Blade sequels, which is sad. But uh, maybe they'll just send what you want. You're a fellow game designer. Let's just give you one for free. Mountain Blade. Uh, man, I just want to meet the people who made Mountain Blade at GDC someday. That's one yeah. on my bucket list. Alright, I'll, uh, I'll see if I can... I know the guy who makes the music for it. We're old buddies, so, you know, cool. we're one degree of separation now. Uh, I wanted to go back to Electronic Superjoy real quick, yeah. um, and hopefully I'm not taking us too far off track, but you seem to be to make a pretty strong point on the fact that it's not like a rhythm game that uh, you have to act... Uh, in accordance to the rhythm of the, the music, you, you get to act independently of that. And it reminded me of something Sean McGrath said when I first met him playing Dyad. I'm like, oh, cool, is it a rhythm game? He's like, no, I hate those. He's like, <laughs> He's like you shouldn't oh, even be McGrath. a slave to the it's rhythm. So you know, the, you're supposed to feel it. You don't need to, like... Was yeah. that something you were thinking, too? Like, you didn't want to have um, to... Sean and John Mack with Everyday Shooter mm. both sort of... They were very close friends when both those games were being made. And I've hung out with them a bunch since, and that did inform me, that, that concept that it's not a rhythm game. Like, a Crypt of the Necrodancer is a perfect example. They're really nice people. Uh, it's a great game. But it's the exact opposite of ESJ. It is, mm. you are following the beat. Right. And, um, I, yeah, I just wanted to listen to the music. Huh. You wanted to cause the feeling of the music without forcing you to, because you do, at least for me, once the music becomes work, kind of, like I need to follow you music, like sheet music, you don't get to just feel it freely in the same way. It becomes like, yeah. Um, yeah. So I like to read, and my mother was a writer, and she couldn't read certain books because she'd see what was going on. She'd watch the grammar. She'd, you know, she'd understand what the person was trying to do. It's the same with games. I, I'm a game designer. I'm not a gamer at this point. It's not, I have no choice. When I look at a game, it breaks apart into its component pieces, and I, I understand what they're trying to do with this mechanic. And I, I play games where that's really finely crafted. And I'll play games that are terrible, that I know are terrible, because I'm just appreciating, like, this part of the craft that went into building this thing. And I really would never want to become a musician, because I would stop just listening to it. Sure, sure, sure. Movies, too. After you've uh, done any sort of film, you can't help but think about... Oh, and sound. Oh, Jesus. Like, I can't watch YouTube anymore without noticing, like, how echoey the sound is and blah, blah, blah. Yeah. Once you sounds, get an ear for it. It's everywhere. Like, it's just, you know, and then and then also, there's a lot of really bad sound engineering out there. 
I've done it. I've done a lot of that sound engineering myself terribly. Hopefully I'm better now. I'm, trying. I'm, I'm getting really into storyboarding. I'd be oh, yeah? I, want, I want to do a Greeble for, for Adventure Time uh, and just send it to Pendleton Ward. But um, I've just been doing tons and tons of sketching. I'm developing a new callus on my thumb, which is lovely. Oh, um, from sketching. Cool. Yeah, and sc- storyboarding sounds amazing. Like, it seems like sort of the indie game dev lifestyle. Like, they really throw themselves into it. And it's one of those things where it's like, hey, you don't want to work evenings and weekends for the rest of your life? You shouldn't do this job. Um, and I was reading through the art book of uh, Adventure Time, Art of Ooh, and there was all these different paragraphs, and I was just, and occasionally there was this one person, some paragraph would be like, yes, this person, this person, work ethic and joy and loving their life and loving their job, and you know, they're, and then it turned out that this was all mostly from the same person. It was uh, Rebecca Sugar. Oh, and, uh, yeah. She, so I've been watching her new show, uh, Steven Universe, because apparently she's the first woman to ever make a, a Cartoon Network like head, and she's also, all the episodes she's on are the ones of Venture Time that I love. They're the, like, she does a lot of the, like, song-based ones, and the ones that aren't about fighting a monster, they're about having breakfast. She did the yeah. bacon pancakes thing. Like, <laughs> yeah, she did the uh, Daddy, Why'd You Eat My Fries song, I think, too. Yeah, and yeah. Um, uh, the, yeah, I'm definitely going to have to go, like, nerd out and shake her hand and get her autograph at the next, you know, Comic-Con. Um, yeah. I did that with John Romero, too. Like, these people don't know I exist. And I, like, first time I met John Romero, I was like, oh, my God, you may do. Oh, my God, oh, my God, oh, my God. And he's like, yeah, please, step back. And I'm like, yeah. Okay. <laughs> huh. So you don't immediately go in and be like, well, I also made a thing. You should check it out. We should do a collaboration. It sounds like you... you I need... assume they've never heard of my thing. Like, ESJ is poss- probably the most famous thing. I, I've done some work on some other projects that I'm either contractually obligated to not mention, or I did uh, some level design on um, on a whole bunch of shit. But like, yeah. Hmm. Yeah, it's pretty a intriguing to leave it hanging. Time. Yeah, not yeah. all of them. Though. It's intriguing. Well, and and then a lot of my games, because the thing is, I see all the tiny projects that don't succeed, and I see all the jam games, and it's a very rare game that actually succeeds and makes money and people talk about. It. And so everybody talks about ESJ to me, whereas I haven't really been working on ESJ for a year. It's like, oh, but that was last year. But of course, they don't, you know, they don't know what my my daily life is. Sure. Um, and like, for example, I did a, I did, was the first person to do a GDC talk about depression in the game industry. Oh, really? Um, yeah, it's, it's out. It's on YouTube somewhere. My Wikipedia page says that I'm a mental health advocate because uh, when that was made and like, for years afterwards, I was the depression guy. And I'm like, yeah, I mean, I gave a talk on it once. I'm, I'm not the depression guy, but okay. <laughs> well, do you remember what year that was that you gave the talk? Uh, no, that would have been maybe 2010. Oh, okay. All right, so yeah. before ESJ, but yeah, yeah. Uh, and it's interesting point. to see depression as a theme in games has, like, become a hot talking point since then. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Um, I, uh, I I suffer from depression. I take antidepressants, um, and the the talk was before I started taking the antidepressants. Um, so I was far more into how do you harness your depression to make your art more real. Huh. I was a lot a lot more pretentious back then. <laughs> that doesn't sound pretentious. It sounds like uh, grasping at trying to work with a tool depression, uh, which is something that takes away so many other tools from you. But it is a particular perspective that all you can do is try to work with it to, to make something from it. That You just summed up the entire talk. That's exactly oh, what nice. the talk was. It was, um, you know, what happens when you get horribly depressed and you hate your project and you quit it? What happens when you can't finish your games? So you make games in short time periods and you jam. And uh, I, I had a game that I set out to use Envy's music in a long time ago called Broken Brothers, and it was meant to be very happy. And it ended up being the most melancholy, sad piece of shit. I cut his music and I put in piano music. And that was the one, uh, so that was the first time I got an email from Steam saying, hey, would you like to put this game on Steam? So it, it was successful, huh. but it was, uh, you know, I made it the week, I made it in 10 days, and it was the 10 days that my parents divorced, and I was so depressed, and I poured it all into the game. And a lot of people liked the game because it sort of, it's, it was very real, but um, you got you got to use what you've been dealt yeah, absolutely. Huh. Uh, so and what's the name of the game you're working on now? So the one I'm working on now, uh, I really have to count how many games I've made. I think I've made like 30, 
five finished games. <laughs> so, like, oh, is our, there a list somewhere? I can. Uh, yeah, I think I think if you go to michaeltoddgames.com slash games, I think there's a list to everything. Okay, but I'll check um, that list out. So the new games is uh, Scurvy Devils. You can go to scurvydevils.com, and there won't be a website because I haven't made it yet, but I own it. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> um, it's very new. It's it's definitely an alpha. I have a prototype where you can. Um, so the ships are made out of tiles, uh, sort of like Captain Forever, uh, if you played that, or mm -hmm. Minecraft, if, if you haven't. Um, sure. So essentially, cannonballs will hit your ship, and it will knock. It will damage one tile, and so your ship, you know, is built out of these tiles, and there's decks, and uh, you build a pirate ship, and you start with a rowboat and a pistol, and that is about the smallest ship you could possibly have, and you eventually build giant dreadnought behemoths. And you build them entirely out of pieces, so you don't so much have a character as in League of Legends. You have a pile of gold and an editor, and you can build blueprints, and so you can build all sorts of different ships. My favorite one I've built so far is, is the front half of the ship is almost entirely uh, steel armor blocks, and then the back is just covered in cannons, and but they're short-range cannons. So you just advance under fire until you're almost there, and you survive because of the armor, and then you turn and you broadside them point blank with your uh, snub nose cannons, and so you can, so it's you can develop your own tactics. So there's a you can be a scout or you can be a support or you can be a tank because you build your ship to to have those qualities. Uh, how many players at a time? So currently it will be one v one, two v two, or three v three. Right now it's based around sort of one lane. Uh, classic MOBA, but I, it's also going to have a co-op mode where you can have um, up to three people fighting um, a giant weird boss creature, and it's going to be procedurally generated, and I'm going to have some user content in there. So, oh, that sounds awesome. So that would be more along the lines of a campaign aspect, where it would be or at I least mean, a score attack type thing. In order to preserve the fact that I want to build the game on my own, I have to cut... I have to design it so that I reuse content between the co-op and the single player and the multiplayer really heavily. Mm. Um, one reason I can do this is because you build your ships out of pieces. So if you want to build your ship differently for a multiplayer game versus a single player game, that's okay. Because I, I coded the same tiles. So it doesn't mm. add more work to my plate. Um, sure. And then essentially I'm going to take the mobs from the multiplayer game and I'm going to make a really big mob with all sorts of complicated things and he's going to become a boss. And it's just because I build the monsters in the game out of tiles, and I have a tile editor, and so I, dragging together a rowboat is about the same work as dragging together a dreadnought. Right. Awesome. And you're doing all the graphics yourself, all the coding yourself, the whole thing? Yes. So one of the reasons it might crash and burn, at which point I will have to redesign it and make something else, uh, is the networking. Uh, this is the most complicated networking project I've ever worked on. Mm. I think I've pulled it off, but it will not be 100% certain until I've got like 100 people playing on the server and we're really testing it. And then sure. the art style. I know how to do pixel art, um, but for the first time in five or six years, I'm doing vector art. And I'm doing 2D, cartoony. The reason I'm drawing tons and tons of Adventure Time, I, I, I drew 100 fins just as practice. And then I'm, I'm drawing 100 Jakes, and I'm going to do 100 Ice Kings after that. And uh, I want this to be bright and cartoony like Adventure Time, and it's sort of a low polygon... Um, Adventure timey kind of style, like it, it doesn't look the same because it's made out of polygons, um, but it's sort of bright and cartoony and simplified in that sense. And uh, I'm, again, in order to keep the the workflow simple, if this is my uh, Android tablet. Someone gave it to me at a PAX. Some, I probably whoever made it, Nexus, Samsung, yes. Oh, awesome. I, I've used it for hundreds of hours at this point, and I'm building my own uh, in Unity. I'm building my own 2D. You probably can't see that because of the screen uh, brightness. It's but. quite bright. It's nice, though. It's a nice computer. <laughs> um, I build, I'm going to build almost all of my artwork on that um, because I build it on the tablet to put together 2D meshes and animate them. Oh, wow. Awesome. Uh, um, it, it's funny. Pendleton Ward, I believe, said that that's how he would want an Adventure Time game to look, and there was at least one episode of Adventure Time I believe it was directed by David O'Reilly, who uh, did uh, some work on the movie Her with Spike huh. Jones. That is like low, uh, well, it's it's high polygon count, but uh, you know, no texture low maps. Low fly so. kind of thing. Yeah, yeah, it's yeah. beautiful episode. It's a really funny episode too. Yeah. I wonder about an Adventure Time crossover for Scurvy Devils. That'd be good. I'd love to do it. it. Adventure Time's <laughs> my favorite show easily. Um, I'm really jealous of Terry. Terry is a friend of mine I've known for I don't know five, ten years, 
and he made the and he made Super Hexagon, and uh, Pendleton Ward is a huge fan of Super Hexagon. Uh, so I, I just like I've been watching Adventure Time. I'm like, oh man, that's a Super Hexagon! Oh my god! That's <laughs> yeah, so there's awesome. that. I'm also that super one jealous. You know, that's cool. <laughs> <laughs> well, geez, I, I want to help you in any way I can. I want to get you with the Mountain Blade people. A Mountain Blade Scurvy Devils Adventure Time <laughs> triple crossover would be amazing. And I'm one degree of separation from a lot of these people. I know some of the the people at uh, Way Forward. And they sent me a little autograph. They made a few of the Adventure Time games. They sent me a little autographed Adventure Time. Uh, uh, what's the name of the book? The one with the jewels in it. Anyway, it's got a drawing of Finn and a uh, signature from Pendleton Ward on the back. Yeah, the uh, I Covidian or something. Yeah, yeah, it's from a little while. So, um, yeah, so the art style is going to be new for me, and I've I've spent a month building that tool, and I'm going to have to really come to grips with it. I've I've do most of my pixel art on my iPad um, using Sprite something. Uh, I think his name, David, I think, uh, in Winnipeg. He's just an indie who built the tool for himself, and then I bought it on the App Store for 10 bucks. It's a great tool. If you do pixel art, you should definitely look at it. And I built almost 90% of the art for Groove City I drew on an iPad. And really? the workflow is so good. The workflow, you get to work on a bus, you get to work on a plane. It's really easy. You can just snap it on and off. And then the actual, I saved my hours of hunched over a computer being focused in alert time for the stuff that I can't do anywhere else, like network coding. Right, right, right. That makes sense. So again, time management, using all the time you have to be productive. Like, when do you take time to not be productive? But there are times when you're just like, and not playing a video game either, just like some sort of stillness. Do you ever have that? Yeah, I get up in the morning and I have tea and I look out my window for 10, 20 minutes before I start to work. It's very important because otherwise... Otherwise, it all blurs together. You've got to have time like that. And I exercise um, because it's a way of keeping the energy high so that I can work more, but also it's 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 you can turn your brain off and you can just lift uh, heavy things and put them down again. So uncomfortable, um, though. I mean, when you have to work, it, it hurts put, uh, doing anything that's strenuous. You, you like it anyway? Yeah. Um, I learned it from us. Uh, well, I learned it from Jason Kaplan in Toronto, but I really... The, the people who really uh, live this philosophy are the, is the indie house down in Phoenix. Um, mm. Every one of them works out. Three of, three of the four of them do CrossFit. So Gravity Ghost, Steve Swink, who's doing Scale, Kyle Pulver, who's done like 8 million different games. He did five games in a year recently. Five! <laughs> they're all on sale. Like, they're all five finished. <laughs> That's insane. I managed one in like a year and a half. He does five. Oh, Kyle. He's got blue hair. He's cool. Yeah. We, we worked together at a global game jam. We worked next to each other, rather, at different right. games. And I worked for 47 and a half hours with a half-hour nap. And I checked Twitter for maybe, you know, half an hour. He checked Twitter for two minutes and worked for 48 hours. Like, he's one of the very few people on Earth who can just <laughs> work me to the ground without blinking. And then not really, you know, he's just sort of modest. He's like, oh, did I, did I do that? I, I didn't notice I did that. That's cool. You know, let's go get food. And I'm just like, oh, I'm dead. And they all work out a lot, too? I know Steve yeah. is a, a fit fella. Oh, Jesus. Uh, Steve, Steve's built out of a slab of muscle. Um, yeah, and part of it is if you work out a lot, it's it's a way of relaxing. It's a way of getting endorphins and having fun if you get addicted to it. it some types of workouts aren't that. But if you get addicted to it and you get your endorphins from it, it's a way of getting more energy by essentially taking time to not work. Huh. Um, and giving your brain time to empty, yeah. or at least still, so new ideas can fill into it. Uh, these days, I'll yeah. talk a little bit about myself, I have three, four jobs. So there's never a time when I'm not worried about, like, is the next thing going to happen when it should, yeah. and is everybody happy, I'm managing people, and blah, blah, blah. And I found, like, I used to just suddenly have an idea come to me, like, oh, I'll sing a song about Captain Falcon's butt today, that'll be funny. But okay. if you have to worry all the time about the next thing, the yeah, brain it is constantly activated. Yeah, 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 yeah. Whereas if I just did more push-ups, maybe well, that would open my brain up a little bit. Also, having a workout partner. So one of my best workout partners, uh, we became firm friends in uh, Toronto, was Jason Cannon. He did the uh, level design, some of the game design for uh, Guacamole and uh, oh, wow, uh, cool. a couple of things. But it was really, really fun. Both of us would meet after come from the office. We'd go to the gym, uh, and we'd just shoot the shit for an hour while we lifted weights. And it was like hangout time that was also, because powerlifting, 
I don't know about other types of working out. Other types of working out, I've tried them. I don't like them. They hurt. They mm. suck. I don't. Yeah. Don't actually. Jogging is the worst. God. 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 How do you jog? jog? I can't breathe. That feeling where you can't breathe and your lungs are acid. Why do people do that? <laughs> yeah, like want to die? Try jogging. That's how it yeah. feels. It's terrible. It's just feel so, like you're gonna choke to death. Yes. Powerlifting done right. I can lift. I can do what I call double deadlifts, which is I lift uh, a, a deadlift uh, twice, and this is like takes me maybe three minutes, right? Because it's so heavy, I have to put it up and then I have to take a breather and psych myself up and do it again. And by the end of that, I am sweating out of every pore, and the endorphins are starting to hit. It's like I've already run seven kilometers. And then by the end of twenty minutes, I'm as high as a kite, and I've had my workout for the day. Um, awesome. it's, 20 yeah. minutes of just lifting things that are heavy. I used to be a giant fat ass and then basically at some point I figured out that people who are really into exercise, they don't just have tons of willpower. They're addicted to it. They, mm. They've gotten past it to the point where they can't not go to the gym and they want to go to the gym and they're really pissed off when they can't go to the gym. Uh -huh. And so if you can just find the right form of drug then uh, you're good. Sure, sure, sure. I, I, yeah. Drug being a metaphor for working out, please don't take drugs. Well, it's all <laughs> well, it's all biochemistry, isn't it? You take a drug, yeah. your brain biochemistry will change. You lift a heavy weight, your biochemistry yeah. will change. It gets a lot of stress out, which is good because you want to have most of the cool jobs are really high stress jobs, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. For yeah. anyone who's having trouble going to sleep at night, too, uh, yeah. that's usually because you just have more energy than you know what to do with. Uh, no focus for it. Uh oh, are you gone, Michael? He's oh, back. wait, he's back. Hey. hey. Hi, Michael Todd. Well, how did you uh, sum your, summon yourself back? What are you using for technology now? Uh, I'm using a phone with uh, unlimited data and Google Hangouts. Oh, cool. And yeah, you know what? Right. The picture quality, it's not quite as good, but now we're even close to your face, so it's nice. This is like um, a, a romantic. I, yeah? I left my headphones downstairs. Is the uh, sound quality all right? It's actually quite good. Cool. Um, yeah. Yeah. Uh, power went out for the whole block. California doesn't really like rain very much. Son of a gun, really. Here I am in the third blizzard uh, of the year already. Uh, right. Power totally on. And you in California, sweet sunny California, the rain got you. Uh, yeah, Nova Scotia is the same way. It's like, oh, yeah, it snowed for three days. What do you mean? Of course everything's still running. Why wouldn't it be? <laughs> <laughs> well, thanks so much for joining us. We'll wrap up. We'll, we'll do another 10 minutes, if, uh, 10 minutes, if that's okay with you. We have a couple of questions yeah. that came in. But I did want to ask you, uh, before we move to that, Electronic Super Joy, the first one is really big. And then Groove City isn't as big, and then Hot Sticky Mess isn't as big. What was the creative decision behind that? Did you not um, want to, like, toil for another three years but still wanted to give people content? Or did, uh, well, yeah, what was the thinking? Yeah, that's that's pretty much it. Um, ESJ took me a year or a year and a half, based on how you look at it, to make. And mm. that was 45 levels, three bosses. Um, a boss takes me about half a month to make, and then the rest of the levels... Um, where so Groove City was built in less time. It was built in three months, and um, Hostiki Mess was built very part time. They had they had to keep coming back to it, but again, it was sort of only a couple of months. And basically, it came down to the fact where I I didn't have the time. I didn't have the time. Mm -hmm. I, I would run out of rent money, and then it would sure. come out. So especially with Groove City, I made the choice. It was either to come out small and call it a mini sequel or whatever. I really didn't want it to be DLC because I wanted people who hadn't bought the first one to try this one. Yeah. And yeah, it being short is one of my biggest regrets for it, but it's uh It is? Yeah, I wish I wish it had way more levels, but it was just I didn't have six more months before. Uh, I yeah, yeah. I, I think it's perfect. I, I, for me, it's not perfect. Because if you play Electronic Super Joy first and then play Groove City it feels a little bit backwards. Like, Groove City feels like it's getting you ready for Electronic Super Joy. Um, but the the way that you started it on consoles, because Electronic Super Joy is now on Xbox One and Wii U, is that right? So it's coming to Xbox One. It's out on oh. Wii U now. And this is Groove City. And it's because one of the things I did with Groove City was I built it so that I rewrote the engine. Ah. PSJ is uh, a laggy hunk of crap where, I mean, it's fine on computers, but it won't run on your phone. Uh -huh. um, whereas Groove City is out on iOS and Android and was designed to have a control scheme that works well with um, tablets and so forth, and it's out on Wii U and it will be coming out on consoles. And then the hope is ESJ2 or future products will be built on this engine mm. so that I now have an engine that I can 
build a game in, and it will come out on all these different platforms and come out on the consoles, and all I need to do is build levels for it. So at some point, when I have six months or a year of rent, and I can get together with, say, Cassie and a couple of the level designers, we'll probably blitz out an ESJ2. But, um, awesome. So awesome. A couple of years. But probably less chance of ESJ1, which to me is, you know, the, 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 still my favorite in this series. Yeah, I like yeah. it. Maybe, like, we could do it, but we'd have to port it, and it would take a large amount of time. We'd have to essentially rebuild the levels in the new one. Right. Um, there's no way of saving it. You right, have to right, right. Create it brick by brick. That might uh, to make to with again the one of the themes of this conversation is how much time do you have? If you only have time to make ESJ two versus porting ESJ one, which pretty yeah. much anybody with a computer could play, it would make sense to to make a, a new thing. But of course, whenever you do, I'll be happy with it. So thank you for doing things, Michael Todd. I do appreciate it. Uh, Moros asks. How did you get the idea for the sexy noises in ESJ2? Uh, yes, there are sexy noises, both male and female, uh, sounding uh, aroused. And the, the, when I recommend ESJ, I almost always tell people, like, even if you get frustrated, keep playing because you'll walk forward into a new NPC that will make you laugh eventually, and it'll, it'll all be worth it. The NPCs are hilarious in the series, and they keep going. So, yeah, how did you come up with the ideas for both of those things? So uh, that goes to Ryan Roth, the sound engineer. Uh, so he didn't do the music. He did the sound effects, and he helped us master the music. Um, and he did he put in the uh, orgasms. He was looking for um, sounds that would work with any of Envy's music at any point. So mm. human voices and stuff like uh, clapping and uh, record scratches and stuff. So that's why the jump or the stomp is a clap. Um, and the checkpoints are a human voice. So it was from a technical standpoint. But he put in this uh, hot lady moaning for whenever you got a new checkpoint. And the playtesters at this one playtest party loved it because there was a bug where every time you respawned, it played. And oh, yeah. It was a reward. Every time you died, you're like, oh, okay. But, it, you know, it got a laugh out of the room every time. Sure. And then um, I insisted he had uh, an equal amount of male voices, which is actually quite hard, apparently, on the Internet. There's a million recordings of females orgasming, but there's almost none of males or orgasming. So we had to really track those down. So at one point, there was a week where we were just looking for sounds of men coming, which was an interesting week. <laughs> um, so those, wait a minute, those sound effects are, are real people having an orgasm sounds? No, I mean, some of them are them being faked, but they are like orgasm sounds. So, yeah, you unless you asked them, did you fake or not, you wouldn't know, but they're at least trying to. It's not yeah. like you got in a sound studio and faked it yourself. Uh, you found real fakes one, one or of real the sounds, reels. One of the sounds is from an actual person who came into our office and recorded. Because um, we actually did a whole bunch. Of the Pope was going to be voice acted. Um, oh, wow. My friend Ryan Crichton, who, who did this, I have this little video on my YouTube channel that's him going, blush for me, and, and all this stuff, but... um. It's just time and money, and at some point we had to ship it. But sure, sure. And and then the, the, there's uh, the various sort of slightly more jokey ones, which we found and, and loved and couldn't not put in, like the oh yeah and the ooh la la, the ooh la la one is my favorite. <laughs> yeah, those are great. I'm so happy those happened. And the NPCs, did you know from the start that you were going to kind of offset the tension of the game with little cute characters, which uh, I'm really, just from a design perspective, the fact that you don't have to go up to them or press a button or anything, you you know that the player is going to want to hear them talk. So as you walk by them, just a little bit of dialogue pops up. Yeah. And it's very well-timed, uh, depending on where you jump in the level and, and some of the games you'll have a dialogue string that'll be different than others, uh, but it's regardless very fun to read. Yeah, that one's that was an interesting one because we um, you didn't I didn't want to slow anything down. Uh, when you finish a level, it puts you in the next level. There's no menu with stats and this is how much you died because I didn't want to break it. I just wanted it to flow. So there's almost no menu, and then essentially when you go to the menu, you stop everything and, that, and then you, you go back in. Um, so yeah, for for that we just. Uh, yeah, we that 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 wasn't super planned. It just sort of happened, and it's how I wrote the dialogue because I had this simple little thing that popped up text when you went near an NPC, and then I wanted to do longer dialogue, but there was a maximum length of string, so I had to put the characters next to each other, and it just sort of happened. And um, the characters being cute, that's mostly Cassie's fault, and then the writing was mostly my stupid sense of humor. Uh, uh, that's great. Ah, that was fun. Uh, Philster95 asks... 
How many concepts did you scrap before deciding to work and focus on ESJ? And how did you know ESJ was worth investing so much time in, LOL? So I actually built the prototype for ESJ. It was called Techno Ninja about a year, maybe a year and a half before I started actual development in 2012. And it was going to be a 20-minute game for um, Xbox Live Indie Games, so XBLIG, which is like the tiny XBLA equivalent. And it got dumped because I got a job working for John Mack on Sound Shapes uh, as a level designer. And then I was making more money from that than I would to put a game on XBLIG, and I was, you know, busy trying to make rent, as always. And then uh, a year and a half later, I was looking for a game, and I was like, you know... I know what game I want to make. And I pulled out the prototype and I had the game and I, was, and I went and talked to Envy and I said, hey, look, I want all of your music, not just one track. And it, it started happening. Um, the reason I went for it was because I wanted something that was action-based. I just finished a puzzle game called Little Gardens, which is cute and had some fans, but it was very slow, very puzzle-based. You know, there's uh, very sort of slow mil music being played in the background. And so I wanted the opposite. I wanted to really kick ass and have action and energy. And then this game was one of my games that I really liked that I hadn't pulled out from my prototypes folder and put in my, you know, finished games folder. So, yeah. And um, the whole game was very not planned. It was sort of I just dived in at one end with a whole bunch of money and came out the other end with a whole bunch of debt, and then hopefully it made it back. <laughs> huh. do, do you think it's a little bit of a survival of the fittest thing where you come up with all of these ideas and then the ones that you're willing to return to when you're like, what am I going to do? Uh, I'm passionate about doing something, well, but I, I'm not sure what that is. Oh, I'm getting, I'm getting a feeling from Techno Ninja. That's what I want to do, and then you run with it. Because uh, mm -hmm. I'm sure you had a bunch of other prototypes you could have returned to, but that's the one that, that stood out. So I have this thing going back five, ten years called my idea wall. And so whenever I come up with a game idea, which is sort of way too much, I can't possibly make them all, um, what I do is I write a one-page synopsis of it with doodles and pictures and whatever, and it's normally just a sheet of lined paper, and I stick it up my idea wall, which is five pages of paper. Is it uh, here? Or are you looking? Are you pointing to it? Uh, right no, I'm in, I'm in the wrong house, unfortunately. Oh, but, um, <laughs> oh yeah, you're in California, sorry. Yeah, yeah, yeah. and then when I have a, a sixth idea, I have to stick it over top of one. So I have to pick the one I'm... So I can only have five ideas on top, and so... When I finish a game, I get to take the sheet off and I get to see what's underneath it. And so at one point in Toronto, my idea wall was like 20 pieces of paper thick and I needed to nail it into the wall to keep it there. Um, and yeah, I'm, I sort of, it's, it, survival of the fittest with ideas is really important. I, a good idea is incredibly important, but on the other hand, you can have a hundred ideas and you shouldn't be beholden to the first one. I, I, I infuriate my friend Jim McGinley because every time I, I send him a Christmas card or something, I make it out of one of my game docs. Uh, like the original, because he keeps everything and I destroy everything. <laughs> I just, you know, I filter and like I'll just clean up my desk by picking it all up, and putting it in the garbage can, and then starting new stuff. And it, it causes a like a, a turmoil of like new ideas constantly being brought to the surface. But uh, yeah, I piss him off. Awesome. <laughs> that, that, I would not. Just between you and me, if you want to send me one of your original game docs, I will not be pissed off. If I even if you turn it into a Christmas card, if I get to like. Uh, pick it apart and find uh, little pieces of your ideas in there. That would be a heck of a lot of fun for me, personally. Uh, you worked on Sound Shapes. Cool. Which uh, levels yeah. did you make on that? Um, none of the levels I made made it into the game. We built hundreds of levels, and he only kept a very few because he's very... He's a genius, and he had a very specific vision, and we, there was like six or seven level designers in the end, plus himself, mm -hmm. and he ended up shipping with very few levels because he wanted a particular set of, like, vibe. Yeah. Um, my job was the coolest job. You, you know that commercial where it, it's like, be a game designer, and it shows some people on a Game Boy, and it's like, you know, yeah, tighten up the, le the levels on level three or whatever, the graphics on level three. That was my job. I, got, I went in in the morning, and I picked up my PS Vita, which was a dev kit, and so it looked like a PS Vita that plugged into a wall, and I built levels on it. That was my job. I was being paid to do because it has a level editor. Oh my editor. god, this job! <laughs> so you use the? Did you use something like the Sound Shapes level editor to make the levels? Yeah, no, we used the actual Sound Shapes level editor. That was one of his main tenets of faith that the yeah. game built in its own editor. Um, and one of the reasons why he had about half the level design team 
including me, work inside the device was to constantly make sure the device was easy to use. Uh, yeah, yeah. That makes sense. We had him on this show to talk about that game. And that is, I love doing this show, and I, I love talking to the people, but that was definitely one of the worst episodes of the show, not because of, of Jonathan. He was wonderful. But Destructoid had just reviewed Sound Shapes. I didn't review it and gave it kind of a bad score. And then he ended up on the show right afterwards, like after he had just read us say, like, your game's not that good. And then here I am being like, thanks for being on my show. And it was all frowns. He was so sad at me. I don't blame him for being sad at me. Tell him I said uh, I love him. Thanks for being on the show, and I'm sorry that our review was like that. He's a nice guy. He doesn't have a mean bone in his body that I've ever seen, but he was he worked the hardest. I crunched for a month, maybe three months. I think the longest I've ever crunched is like four or five months. He crunched unbelievable amounts of time for six or seven months, maybe a year on that game. Like Jesus. Uh, yeah, it's an awesome game. Uh, I ended up quitting, like no no bad blood or anything, but I ended up quitting the team to work on my own games because it was just crunch time and it wasn't going to end for a year. And I was like, this is great, <laughs> but unless you're willing to double my paycheck or, you know, somehow make me lose all the weight and... Is that... Cr it, 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 if it's crunch time, like crunch time to me is like a sprint. Uh, I don't think you can sprint for a year. That's not a sprint anymore. That's just like having to run fast or you will die. Yeah, that's pretty much what it became. And <laughs> it's awful. Uh, but the and product is so great, though. It's hard for me to complain, but I can't help but be worried about that man. I uh, I very strongly like am tr I'm very anti crunch. I do crunch, but I I don't like making my employees crunch, and mm. I don't I prefer not to crunch at all if possible. It is always the ideal. Whereas there's a lot of game designers who get into the Crunch is holy, like crunch is necessary. So huh. I'm on the other school of thought there. What is the, the pros and cons to a crunch? All I see is the cons, I guess. You get um, a lot more done in a short period of time. If you're So there's short-term crunching and there's long-term crunching. If you crunch for two days, you can get a lot more done. Because, yes, there's all these arguments you're not as productive after your first six hours of work, but you have ridiculous amounts more hours of work. So when I was working on Broken Brothers, I pulled a 111-hour week four times in a row, and that's a lot of hours. That's an insane amount of hours. I was sleeping under my desk, like, and I did nothing else. And then I had a breakdown and stopped working on the game. But, uh, and, you know, <laughs> the two are related. Uh, you yeah, can't... yeah, yeah. Huh. I can't help but feel like pacing yourself will lead to better work in the long run. I, I If I've been working for uh, 20 hours straight, which happens every once in a while, the work I'm doing at the end of those 20 hours is not very good. Uh, yeah, you spend four hours to do to fix one bug. You you know, you, your your brain is dead at that point. I don't crunch as much anymore, and if I never crunched between now and when I die, I'd be very happy. So it's yeah, I slowly learn. Well, I want you to be happy, Michael Todd, and keep making these video games for me to play. Thank you so much. Should wrap up the show. They can follow you on Twitter. You're at the game designer. One word. Yep. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And Michael Todd Games is your company. You can check out yeah. things there. Electronic Superjoy is on Steam. Electronic Superjoy Groove City is on Steam, Wii U, and iOS devices? iTunes? iOS and uh, Android, so Google Play and uh, App Store. Oh, cool. And, uh, and yeah, then and Pop Sticky Mess uh, is on just Steam? Just Steam right now, yeah. Right, right, um, right. Talking to them... Uh, sort of a sub team within a team like you know we're we're all friends but um we're going to see if we can bring it to a bunch of other stores but we'll see it's all one thing at a time yeah yeah and yeah. Uh, yeah i think that's all of the games and all of the stuff sure scurvy devils scurvy yeah, devils follow me on twitter if you want to uh, hear me talk about the game as it goes along that's a, i'm really excited about scurvy devils and i see that doing well on consoles too if that's possible. I think that there's a, a lot of people hungry for that kind of experience with their friends on consoles these days. Yeah, I've designed it to be, um, yeah, it's on the new engine, so it should be able to run on everything. I don't think it'll run on your phone, but... Um, yeah, it's, yeah. Well, they'll make a new phone. It'll run on that. You know, a couple of years from now, the phones will be better. Uh, as for me, I'm at Tron Knots on Twitter, and you can follow me to hear about things. I'm also, I write for Destructoid.com. I'm the editor-in-chief for now. We'll see how long I, so far, I say that every week, and I haven't been fired yet, so you know, 
I'm not going to jinx myself. I'm going to keep talking about how I might get fired, and maybe that will protect me from being fired. So I'm at destructoid.com, writing things there. You can watch this show later on uh, YouTube, youtube.com slash Seth Holmes Show. Many, many reruns on there as well. You can listen to it on Libsyn and iTunes. And I think that's it. Thanks so much, everybody. Take care. Bye-bye.